definitely, beyond any doubt, the worst and most vile creatures on the planet. Yes, snitches then would come in second, and cops would be third. Yeah. How about people who murder other people? What about them? Where do they fall? In where? In your hierarchy. Of badness? They don't. <laughs> you want to throw murders in with cops and chomos? Are you serious? <laughs> You're kidding, right? <laughs> What is one zodiac sign that you would never, ever consider dating? If you're like me, you enjoy learning about what makes these psychopaths and serial killers tick. You'll be amazed to find out that some of these twisted minds have common traits and can easily be classified under that zodiac sign. From crazy to least dangerous, y'all cancers, y'all are top tier. Pisces are next, and I personally know a Pisces and I can... I can definitely see it. Now, Sagittarius are third, and I don't know what they're talking about. I'm a Sagittarius, and they they got to have something wrong. And Scorpios, y'all are the last. And I've heard a lot, a lot of stories about Scorpios, and wondering, are y'all really that bad? The person we're doing today was a Sagittarius, and she is definitely, definitely on that crazy list. Good day, my beautiful people. I am the Mysterious Black Bandit. You know what I need you to do. Go ahead and hit the like, subscribe, turn on those notifications so you don't miss out on any of these videos whenever I upload. Okay, this whole incident began on August 2nd, 2009. Shortly after, 46-year-old Terry Neely left his assistant care facility in his wheelchair. This was something Terry would do on a daily basis. His wheelchair was motorized, so he would often ride around the area just to get some fresh air or maybe go to the store and do whatever he wanted to do just to get away. But this particular time, Terry never returned. For three days straight, no one at the housing facility had heard or seen him, and I'm assuming the staff may have thought he found another place to stay, or maybe he had just left town without telling anyone. But on August 5th, 2009, they would learn the horrific crime that had occurred. Around 5 a.m. that morning, the fire department in Phoenix, Arizona received an anonymous call saying smoke was coming out of trash bin behind the Covenant of Grace Church. The firefighters that were sent out thought that this was just a routine call, but once they got there, that wasn't the case. By the time they arrived, the whole trash can was engulfed in flames. And as they were putting the fire out, they spotted something that looked like a badly charred body, but they weren't too sure. After all the flames and smoke had subsided, they took a deeper look into this dumpster. It was indeed a human body, but it was horribly disfigured and missing some limb. Well, this is when they contacted the police, and when they arrived to investigate, the body had been burnt so badly, there was no way for them to determine if this was an accident or if it was an actual homicide. So it was sent in for an autopsy. According to the autopsy, they noticed an egregious amount of damage had been done to this body. On top of missing body parts, several of his teeth were missing from his mouth, it had multiple blunt force head injuries, and a three inch nail had been driven or hammered into his Then on top of that, it had also been stopped approximately 50 times with a slash to the throat area. This definitely confirmed that this was a murder, but not only that, this person was actually tortured. So to find out who this person was, Dental was taken and after a few days, they finally identified the body as 46-year-old Terry Neely, the paraplegic that stayed at the assisted living home. With this discovery, the police returned back to the scene where Terry's body was found to question the locals and they discovered that not many people knew him too well. However, those who did said that they would see him riding around on his motorized wheelchair every other day and described him as a very friendly and easygoing individual who seemed to have some kind of mental disability. Now, when they asked if Terry had any enemies or been in any recent conflict, no one could provide any lead. Now, this was considered to be one of the most graphic crimes that the Phoenix, Arizona community had ever witnessed. And what made this even worse is that the detectives had little to no information on what happened. They didn't even know where his wheelchair was. And unlike in today's era where we have surveillance cameras everywhere, the only surveillance that they had was at the facility that Terry lived. And that only showed him leaving on August 2nd. 
So the only thing that detectives could do was to go to all the surrounding news outlets to warn everybody that the person who committed this horrible crime was still at large. And if anyone had any information, they should call them as soon as possible. Weeks and weeks had went by and police and detectives were still scrambling trying to find any leads but nothing came about. Luckily out of the blue an anonymous tip came through which was said to be the apartment manager stating that they found Terry's wheelchair outside an apartment building. Now when the police arrived they went to the person that called and they told them they seen smoke coming from one of the apartments a few days ago and when they went and checked they saw a city of Phoenix trash can in the kitchen smoking. As the investigators continued to press for more answers the witness suddenly became a little anxious or nervous because they felt that they had said too much already. Eventually, the witness told them that they had seen a woman named Angela Simpson and Terry together on more than one occasion doing drugs outside an apartment complex and stated that Angela and a man called Edward Cracker McFarland borrowed his car and upon their return, she told them that they had killed and cut up Terry's body and basically threatened them if they mentioned this to anybody, they were going to kill them as well. Now when they went to check out this apartment, it was without a doubt that someone had been murdered there. Blood stains were everywhere and the only furniture they had was a single chair and a floor length mirror. Beside this chair was a pair of those pliers that had specks of blood on it. Parts of the carpet was pulled up and on the counter was a gallon of great value bleach. Now after leaving the apartment, the investigators went and questioned the locals about Edward Cracker and Angela and they all pretty much said the same thing. Some stated that her, Edward, and Terry had been friendly for a while and seemed to have a lot in common. They were all drug addicts, however, Angela was a sex worker and Edward was believed to be her pimp. Now as time went on, the detectives continued to do their investigation, but once that DNA came back that showed that that was actually Terry's blood on the carpet, Angela and Edwards became prime suspects and it wasn't hard for them to find them because both had been arrested a week before after committing a robbery. Now I'm not sure if it was drugs or her mental health or if she even cared at all, but once the investigators finally questioned Angela, with no remorse, she didn't beat around the bush confessing to what she had done. He told on a righteous person years ago, so, and so, he, he told me that. So what did he do, what did you do to him? I killed him. How'd you do it? I beat him to death. For how long? How long did I beat him? 45 minutes, an hour. He was there for three days, right? Yes. What did you do during that time? Well, I... I killed him and him up. She told them she lured Terry out of the facility at around 8 p.m. on empty promises of having sex and doing drugs at her apartment. She stated she knew those were the things he would come for because he was her regular client and if she was offering sex for free, he wouldn't pass on that. She continued and said she remained sweet and kind the whole time, but as soon as she closed and locked that door, the violence began. For three straight days, she brutally took Terry. She beat him over the head with a tire iron and hammer, used grip pliers to pull out several of his teeth and wouldn't even let him use the restroom. So anytime he had to go, he would have to go on himself. While sitting there eating a candy bar and drinking a soda, she goes on to say that she drove a three inch nail into his head with a hammer, stabbed him around 50 something times and to make things even worse she put a mirror in front of him to make him watch as she tortured him stating because I wanted him to see what he deserves. Now this guy Terry had to be a strong individual because even after going through all these horrendous things he was still alive. After those three days of torture this man. Angela finally grew bored and stated it wasn't fun anymore so she decided to finish him off by him with a television cord until he was no longer breathing. Afterwards, she dismembered parts of his body, then took his remains to this trash can and set his body on fire. Now, of course, investigators had to do their due diligence to make sure her detailed description matched the injuries that were found during Terry's autopsy, and pretty much everything she told them was confirmed. Now, in a separate interview, she was asked why did she do what she did? And this is what she said. Uh, you're very upfront. Pretty much. About talking about this killing. Right. You you murdered this man. Yes. You tore 
murdered him. Of course. Well, why, why did this man deserve to die? You, you, you claimed he was a snitch. Well, what proof do you have of that? He told me he was a snitch. He told you. On many occasions. You know, uh, it's I like took him to my house, walked him down the street. I don't know why the media acts like the mother couldn't walk. He walked very well. Walked him upstairs, kicked his ass, and killed him. Even after they told her that they didn't have any information on Terry snitching or being a police informant, she still didn't show any remorse. There is no ambiguity and there is nothing you want to... S yeah, in court today you said uh, you're not here to pretend to be remorseful. Of course not. Why would I do that? Are you remorseful? Not at all. Why? Why would I be? Well, I, wh why, why did this man deserve to die? You, you, you claimed he was a snitch. Well, what proof do you have of that? He told me he was a snitch. He told you. On many occasions. What, why did you feel like you were in a position to be the judge and jury in, in Terry Neely's life? I'm not sure. Yeah. It was just too much. The things he talked about, it was just, it was too much. Do you believe him? I mean, lots of people go around well, claiming I'm a snitch or make themselves... <laughs> really, you don't say. Sort of look. Well, he picked the wrong to say that to if he wanted to brag about putting so many people in prison. Uh, he picked the wrong person. And that's what, that's what did it to him. That's, what, that's why you... What, the bragging? The bragging oh, yeah. about putting people in prison. Right. People you knew? No. No, but I he, don't know any of them. Okay. Do you believe him? Do you think he really was a snitch? Oops, if he wasn't. Yes, I, I believe he was. Yeah. yeah. As the interview continued, Angela said that this wasn't her only time she had killed, but wouldn't tell them exactly how many she had killed. But in a later interview, she retracted that statement and said that was just talk. Now, detectives tried their best to try to get her to confess or admit that Edward helped her with killing Terry. But no matter what they said, she insisted that he had nothing to do with it. She says the only involvement Edward Cracker had was when she asked to borrow his car to dispose of the body, but the police never found any evidence of this. Now, most of the time, I can tell when someone's trying to act psychotic or crazy, but I really don't think this was an act and kind of felt that she really meant what she was saying. In most cases like this, you can go back to the suspect's youth to see how they were raised and it will kind of give you an explanation for why they did what they did. But Angela didn't have much information on her or her upbringing. All there is to know is that at the time of this murder, she was 33 years old and had four children. She claimed in an interview she had a long history of mental illness that became a struggle at the age of 10. Now there's no information on her mother or father, but I'm assuming that they weren't too good of a parents because she was taken from them and put in a foster home. This is when she stated she began abusing drugs and to get the money for the drugs, she would commit petty crimes. Then as she got older, she began doing sex work to pay for her drugs and to cover bills, which led to her spending a lot of her adult life in and out of prison. She claimed going to prison, dealing with mental illness and abuse were all things that were considered normal to her. How do you feel about spending the rest of your life in prison? You know, I got a lot of family in prison and uh, I'm okay with that. I'm okay with that. Yeah. I got many sisters in prison. I can't wait to see them. It's really not that much of a punishment to be sentenced to spend my life with my family. Now, after doing all this research on her, I read somewhere in a comment or something that stated that there's an article of a 10 year old girl with her same name that got hit by a police car and that left her physically and mentally disabled. Now I searched all over for this article, but didn't find it anywhere. Anyway, on August 18th, with Angela's full confession, she was charged with first degree murder and abandonment or concealment of a dead body. And as for Edward Cracker McFarland, he was indicted on felony charges of abandonment and concealment of a dead body and hindering prosecution. Now there's been speculations for a while about this case from a lot of people because they believe that she couldn't have committed this murder by herself. Now I personally know a few people that are paralyzed from the waist down and their upper body strength is pretty doggone strong. For her to do all this beating and everything by herself 
just doesn't seem legit. But let's say that she did do all this torturing by herself. When it was time to move this body, even with it being dismembered, that upper torso is still pretty heavy for her to lift by herself. That's just me, but what do y'all think? Do y'all believe that she would be able to unalive this man on her own, dismember the body, carry the body to the car, then lift it out the car and put it into a trash can? Y'all let me know down in the comments. All right, my true crime fanatics, that will be it for now. If you haven't already, go ahead and hit that like, subscribe, and turn on those notifications so you don't miss out on any video. And until next time, stay mysterious, my friends.